And the next day, August 5th, there was Alger Hiss, all dignity and moderation, every hair in place, and his opening statement went as follows. I am here at my own request to deny unqualifiedly various statements about me which were made before the committee by one Whitaker Chambers the day before yesterday. I welcome the opportunity to answer to the best of my ability any inquiries the members of this committee may wish to ask me. I am not and never have been a member of the Communist Party. I do not and never have adhered to the tenets of the Communist Party. I am not and never have been a member of any Communist Front organization. I have never followed the Communist Party line, directly or indirectly. To the best of my knowledge, none of my friends is a Communist. And he said that, as far as I know, the only time in my life I've ever spoken to a Communist is when my job in the State Department required me to talk to diplomats from Communist countries, and all such contacts were strictly official. So far as I know, I have never laid eyes on Whitaker Chambers, and I would like the opportunity to do so. The statements made about me by Mr. Chambers are complete fabrications. And HUAC was stunned. Usually people who had been named before HUAC either did nothing and said they're a bunch of loonies, who cares what they think, or they took the Fifth Amendment, or like the Hollywood communists, they got into shouting matches with a committee. Hiss didn't do any of those, nor did he say, yes, I was a fellow traveler 15 years ago. I did something stupid when I was in my 20s, you know, big deal, I'm sorry, sort of like I smoked pot when I was in college. He, I, I don't think Hueck had ever heard a denial that was so clear and simple, or seemingly clear and simple, and it was very calm. And Congressman Munt, the acting chairman, sort of stumbled forward and said, I want to say that it's extremely puzzling that a man who's a senior editor of Time magazine by the name of Whitaker Chambers, whom I'd never seen until a day or so ago, and who you say you've never seen, and Hiss said, as far as I know, I have never seen him. And Munt said, should come before this committee and discuss the communist apparatus working in Washington, which he says is transmitting secrets to the Russian government. And at this point, Stripling entered the questioning and said, you say that you've never seen Mr. Chambers? And Hiss said, the name means absolutely nothing to me, Mr. Stripling. And the committee thought maybe this is a god-awful case of mistaken identity. Maybe Chambers is thinking of somebody else or he's thinking of Donald Hiss. And uh, they found a newspaper that had a picture of Chambers in it. The Stripling walked over to Hiss and handed him the picture and said, I show you this picture, Mr. Hiss, and I ask you if you've ever known an individual who resembles this picture. And Hiss said, I would much rather see the individual I have looked at all the pictures that I was able to get hold of in, I think it was yesterday's paper. If this is a picture of Mr. Chambers, he's not particularly unusual looking. He looks like a lot of people. I might even mistake him for the chairman of the committee. And there was a general laughter, and the acting chairman Munt said, I, I hope you're wrong in that. And Hiss said, I didn't mean to be facetious, but very seriously, I would not want to take an oath that I have never seen this man. I would like to see him, and then I'd better be able to tell whether I'd ever seen him. And Stripling, feeling rather humiliated, gave up for the moment. And then Munt said, you realize this man whose picture you've just looked at, under sworn testimony before this committee, where all the laws of perjury apply, testified that he called at your home, conferred at great length, plead with you to divert yourself from communist activities, and left you with tears in your eyes. And Hiss said, I do know that he said that. I also know that I am testifying under those same laws to the direct contrary. And the committee then asked Hiss if he knew other people that Chambers had named, most of whom were well known by 1948 as communists or far lefties, and Hiss answered very generally, I knew this one at Harvard and that one was at the AAA, that kind of thing. And then HUAC decided to wrap up the whole embarrassing thing. And Congressman McDowell said, Mr. Hiss, do you feel you've had a free and fair and proper hearing this morning? And Hiss said, Mr. McDowell, I feel I've, I, I think I have been treated with great consideration by this committee. And C Chairman Munt said, the chair wishes to express the appreciation of the committee for your very cooperative attitude, for your forthright statements, and for the fact that you were the first among those whose names were mentioned by various witnesses to communicate with us, asking for an opportunity to deny the charges. And as a little cherry on top of the icing on the cake, uh, Congressman Lightnin' John Rankin, 
who was an outspoken, incredibly bigoted Democrat from Mississippi, stepped down and pumped Hiss's hand, shook his hand, saying, and another thing, I want to congratulate the witness. He did not refuse to answer questions on the ground that it might incriminate him, and he didn't bring a lawyer with him to tell him what to say. And as Hiss left the committee room and walked the halls of the Capitol building, people saw him coming, and they applauded. And the committee adjourned and stumbled off to lunch. There had been one little exchange, there may have been one little exchange, though, that I can't resist mentioning. It supposedly came in a question asked of Hiss by HUAC's youngest and least senior member, a virtually unknown Republican from California, then finishing out his first term, Richard Nixon. Nixon had asked Hiss for the names of government officials who requested him to come to Washington and work for the AAA. And Hiss answered back, sounding a little snotty and condescending, I prefer not to answer that, Mr. Nixon, because, you know, people's names get mentioned before HUAC in some innocent context, but the next thing you know, there's a headline saying so-and-so named before HUAC, and people think they're communists. And Nixon insisted that Hiss answer. And Hiss said it was Felix Frankfurter, uh, who got me my first government job as uh, secretary to the U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Now, what I'm about to say is not in the transcript, but if you read the transcript, you can see where it could have happened. And several sources say that uh, what Nixon said next, and he later had cut out of the transcript, was something like, that was before Frankfurter was on the Supreme Court, wasn't it? That was when he was your professor. And his answer was, yes, Mr. Nixon, I went to Harvard, and your school, I believe, was Whittier. Uh, if you remember Richard Nixon, especially his social awkwardness and his sense of not being one of the beautiful people, um, you won't be surprised to learn that Robert Stripling said later he was sitting behind Nixon when he said that, and red went up all of Nixon's head, and the, his hairs on the back of his head stood straight out. It is impossible to think of a more offensive thing to say to Richard Nixon. But as I said, the committee stumbled off to lunch and journalists came up to them and said, you guys at HUAC have finally blown it and you've got nobody but yourselves to blame. You have proved true every bad thing ever said about you. Um, you. You gave this guy Chambers a platform without checking into his story, obviously, and he's either making it up or he's crazy or it's some dreadful case of mistaken identity. But whatever, you've completely destroyed whatever reputation you ever had. And they also learned that that morning, President Truman at a press conference had denounced the HUAC hearings as a red herring, a choice of adjective he might later have regretted. So let me ask a question. You're HUAC. What do you do? Give up? Crawl under a rock? Hope everybody forgets about it? But then you're ruined. You're finished. How do you, but how do you dig yourself out of this hole? How do you look deeper? How do you fight on? And after lunch, HUAC met in secret in a state of shock. One member said, we're ruined. Another guy said, we've been had. And they thought of some dodge, like sending both their testimonies to the Justice Department and asking them to figure out who was lying, when up spoke Nixon. And he was aided by Stripling, who, and this is only the first time this happened, each of them claims to have done most of the talking. Nixon said to the other members of HUAC, with Stripling, I want to go ahead with this. I'll, I'll take this case off your hands if you guys don't. Name a subcommittee, I'll be the chairman, I'll do all the work, and I'll take whatever comes out of this, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and HUAC instantly did as he wished. They created a subcommittee with him, with Nixon as the chairman, Congressman McDowell as the ranking Republican, and the token Democrat was a Felix Edward A. Bear of Louisiana. And they asked Nixon, why are you doing this? And Strip, why do you think this is a good idea? And they said, well, there's something worth pursuing here. Uh, first, they said, there was a, f and then maybe this is where Nixon's training as a lawyer comes in. They said, he said, there was a fine thread of equivocation running through Hiss's testimony. He never absolutely denied knowing Chambers. He said, as far as I know, I've never seen him, and I've never known Whitaker Chambers, and we all know that people in the communist underground use false names. And do you remember when Stripling handed him the picture of Chambers and said, you say you've never seen Mr. Chambers? Hiss's answer was, the, the question was, you say, you say you've never seen Mr. Chambers. Hiss's answer was, the name means absolutely nothing to me. 
which is not an answer to the question. So he left open the possibility that he knew Chambers under another name. There was something a little sneaky. There was always, a, to the best of my knowledge, as far as I can recall. And then second, they said, another reason not to write off Chambers is that he's given us the way to prove that he's lying, if in fact he's lying. He said that he and Hiss were good buddies 15 years ago. There are two disagreements between these men. One is whether Hiss was a secret communist, and that's always going to be one guy's word against the other, because when you become a secret communist, you don't sign a contract and file a copy with the Justice Department. Uh, that'll always be one guy's word against the other. We're never going to get any proof on that. But there's another disagreement, and that's whether they were friends, whether Hiss knew Chambers 15 years ago, and we should be able to get some evidence on that. And if we can prove that Hiss is lying about that, we can prove he's lying about something. That will salvage our reputation and put the onus back on him, and maybe we can raise an eyebrow and say, quite sensibly, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out that whoever's lying about the friendship is the one lying about the communist activity. I mean, why would Hiss be lying about that, ex about the friendship, except to cover up the uh, communist activity? So my action plan, or the Nixon Stripling action plan, is to get Chambers under oath in secret as soon as possible, hours count, if it's got to be Saturday morning, we'll do it Saturday morning, and bombard him with questions about the Hiss family's daily life in the mid-1930s. And if he fluffs it, we're screwed, but we're already screwed anyway, nothing lost. If he does give us plausible answers, then as quickly as possible, we get Hiss under oath in secret and ask him the same questions. And if his answers match Chambers, then we know that Chambers is the one telling the truth about the friendship, and we can save HUAC and maybe uncover communist spying in this country. And despite this analysis and explanation, as far as I can tell, everybody else in the room thought that Nixon and Stripling were both nuts and that Nixon was ending a career that had looked like it might have had some promise.